And if you're using one of the Bibles that we passed out here, I'm inviting you to turn to page 983 to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. You know, there have been many times in my Christian life where I have been defeated and I felt in some ways down for the count. And then the Lord has used some scripture to boost my spirit, get me back on my feet and into the fight again. And I pray that this passage will be used by God in all our hearts this way today. Now we're beginning, we're going to go verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, word by word through the letter of Colossians. As I mentioned last Sunday, whenever you get a letter from someone that you dearly love, how you will or you respect, how you will pay attention to everything they say and think about it, read it many times. And certainly whenever you get a letter from God, you ought to pay very close attention to every word he chose to say. Read it many times, think about it. Now we're in the letter of the Colossians, and he begins the letter with this sentence in verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father. As we mentioned last Sunday, this is the starting point of the Christian life. This is how the Christian life begins. This is the atmosphere in which the, Christmas, the Christian life is lived. It is lived with the favor, the preference, the love, the smile of God. A Christian gets this from God the Father. He wants you to know that whatever I'm about to say to you next, I just want to begin the letter and say, whatever I'm going to tell you next, you have God's favor. And he also he says, peace from God the Father. Peace is the word, the Hebrew word shalom. That means everything is well. Everything is healthy. Everything is sound. There's nothing missing. From God the Father, you get two things, which are, which are the incredible strength of the Christian life. His favor, his affection, his preference, his partiality, his smile, and you get from him total wholeness, total wellness. And so it begins a letter with that line, grace to you and peace from God our Father. And now notice the next paragraph, beginning in verse 3 to verse 8. And we're going to pay attention to this paragraph this morning. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. And I just want to pause and answer a question that may come in your mind as soon as you see those words. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does that mean that God is Jesus' Father? Such as when I say the word Father, that He was His progenitor. He gave Him life like our earthly Father does. Is that what that means? That God is the progenitor of Jesus Christ? Well, the Bible also says in the New Testament that God is our Father. Remember Matthew chapter 5. Turn back there for a second, please. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, <clears throat> in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Notice in chapter 6 and verse 4 of Matthew, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Matthew 6, verse 32, For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. So is God my physical Father? No. God is my heavenly Father. He has this role in the universe. He is my spiritual Father. Does this mean when it says in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 3 that God is Jesus' spiritual father? Well, let's answer that question. It's not his earthly father. I mean, not his, like he didn't give birth to Jesus. But does it mean is that, that God is in some way the spiritual father of Jesus like he is the spiritual father of Christians? By the way, we know sometimes in the New Testament that Jesus refers to God as his Father. 
For example, in Matthew chapter 11, in verse 25, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Jesus addresses God. He calls him Father. Is Jesus saying in those many, many passages that God is his spiritual father? Or is the Bible acknowledging in this verse, and is Jesus acknowledging when he says, calls God his father many times in the Gospels when he's on the earth, is he acknowledging this member of the Trinity, his role? Now the Bible teaches everyone very clearly, as I'm going to display for just a few minutes this morning, that God is three persons in one nature. He is three persons who eternally has these persons in one essence. Now watch this in the New Testament. Look at Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. We're just going to do a little quick trace of this. To whenever you see the expression in the New Testament, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, what does that mean? Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Let's see about God himself. What is the doctrine of God? By the way, what we're doing now is called theology, the study of the doctrine of God. Matthew 28 and verse 19, the Bible says that Jesus says to the disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. When people are baptized, they are baptized into the name of three persons, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. So this, this name has three persons that comprise it. Go forward with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. John, chapter 1, and verse 1. One thing, by the way, that false religions will always do is they will take certain texts of Scripture not in the context of all the Bible. There is a certain thing, I've mentioned this word in the past, in Bible study called perspicuity. This is a big word that means the Scripture is clear. This is one of the characteristics of it. It's not confusing. But what you have to do is step back sometimes. Okay, I'm reading a passage and this says a certain phrase. What does that mean? It seems to say on the surface that God is Jesus' earthly father. Perhaps he gave birth to him. Or that in some way he's a spiritual father. Is that what it's saying? Okay, so then I have to step back and say, okay, what does all of Scripture say about this topic? And then when I understand all of Scripture... Then I take that information back into this individual text and it helps me understand it. So notice John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. So whoever the Word is, the Word is God. The Word created all things. The Word has life in Him. These are all things that God has. Now notice verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word is the Son who has come from where the Father is. He has come from where the Father is, but the Word is the Son. He is distinct from the Father. He has come from where the Father is, but He is God, just as the Father is. Notice it says in verse 18, No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. So, God is Father and Son. See? Notice John chapter 5 and verse 18. John chapter 5 and verse 18. 
This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. It was very clear to the Jews that Jesus was saying he is God. He is equal with the Father. These are co-equal persons of one nature. The Father is in heaven. The Son is in heaven. He is God. Notice John chapter 10, verses 30 and 31. John chapter 10, verses 30 and 31. My Father who gave them to me, has given them to me, is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone them. Jesus and the Father are of, they are the same being, but two persons. Notice chapter 14, verses 6 to 11. Chapter 14, verses 6 to 11. The scripture says here, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So in other words, the Father is distinct from the Son. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. So I am the Father. The Father is the Son. But they're distinct. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? See, two persons, same essence. The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe in the count of the works themselves. Jesus is very plain in the Gospel of John. He is the Father, the Father is him, but the Father and the Son are co-equal, distinct persons of the same nature. <clears throat> Notice how the New Testament acknowledges this. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 6. <clears> 1 <throat> Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 6. Just like we are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. This is one name, three persons. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 6. There are varieties of gifts with the same Spirit. There are varieties of service with the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit are all acknowledged. They are the one that whose name we are baptized in. He is the one who gives us gifts. Jesus, the Bible, even in Genesis chapter 1, when God says, let us make man in our image, God is three in one. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14. I'll show you two more. So guys, this is the overall teaching of Scripture concerning the personhood of God. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We are baptized in the name of the Trinity. We are gifted by the Trinity. The Trinity has a role. Each member of the Trinity provides something to a Christian. Grace and love and fellowship. And notice finally 1 Peter chapter 1 in verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 1 in verse 2. It says about those who are Christians, they were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. So our salvation is arranged by God the Father, accomplished by God the Son, and applied by God the Spirit. Now, with that as an overall understanding of the personhood of God, when the Bible says that, and it says here in, in our text now, Colossians chapter 1, 
go back to what it says now as he begins his prayer, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is acknowledging the personhood of God the Father as distinct from God the Son. And when Jesus was on the earth, Jesus referred to him as his Father, acknowledging their distinctness, although we know overall from Scripture they are one and the same, although they have three persons in one essence. So what's happening in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 3 the New Testament is acknowledging God the Father as distinct from God the Son. Now he says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Now here we come to the real crux of this paragraph, the next line. What is it that he thanks God for? He says, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Now, one of the things you'll notice whenever you're reading the letters of Paul, there always is a main point in every paragraph, and there'll be like clauses and phrases that further define the main point. So, for example, he says, this is what I want to say to you. I'm thanking God the Father because of the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. Now look what he says next. Of this, now he's going to talk about this hope. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Now he wants to say a little bit about the gospel. Which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. I'm so glad because of the hope that is laid up for you in the gospel. Oh yeah, this gospel is the one that you heard. And this gospel is doing this in you. Verse 7, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. But what's the main point of the paragraph? I am thanking God because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Now, this is what we want to focus on this morning, everybody, as Christians, those who have faith in the Lord Jesus. I want to speak this morning as he focuses in on this one phrase, the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. Remember, this letter was not only written to the Colossians, but every Christian who would ever read it from, from time on. So number one, we're told in Colossians, from God the Father, you have received grace and peace. Number two, he wants you to know at the beginning of this letter that you have a hope laid up for you in heaven. And he's thanking God for it right now. Now, guys, the word hope is the word that means a certain and sure expectation. This is a guaranteed thing that is coming your way. It's not the American phrase we use today, I really wish, man, I really hope this is going to, I don't know if it's going to, but my desire is that it will. This is not the word hope in the New Testament. The Greek word for hope in the New Testament is a certain and sure, it is a guaranteed thing you can expect. He says, I thank God for the guaranteed future that is waiting for you that is laid up for you in heaven. Of this you heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel. And notice what he says. This gospel that tells you about this hope is bearing fruit in you and it is increasing. Now we're going to come to that at the very end. But for now I want to think about this idea that the Bible says I thank God that for all of you Colossians and all of you down Sidians that have come to faith in Jesus Christ, you have a guaranteed certain expectation that is being reserved for you in heaven. This future thing is going to happen. And I'm already thanking God for it. Now, do you guys know it is this concept, the hope that is guaranteed us in heaven 
that makes such a huge impact on a Christian's life while they live on this earth. In fact, the Bible calls it the sure and steadfast anchor of their soul. Guys, do you have something that is the rock-solid anchor of your life? This is the one thing that will not let you be moved. This is the one thing that doesn't make you float away down the ocean never to be seen again. It's the thing that's keeping you rooted in your life. And no matter what happens, the questions, the doubts, the fears, the painful times, the great times, the hopeful times, everything that's part of life, the thing that's keeping you anchored according to the New Testament, is this. It is the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. That's the sure and steadfast anchor of a Christian soul. Now, what I want to see happen in the few minutes we're going to take this morning is that by the time we're done, it will be that for you. You will have, as I told you in the beginning, there have been times in my life as a Christian I have been defeated, I have been down, you wonder if I got to make it. And all of a sudden, here comes a scripture passage that kind of picks you back up again and breathes life into you again and gets you back inside the race and inside the ring. And this is meant to do that. So let's explore this topic of the New Testament, the hope that is laid up for you in heaven and the impact it's supposed to have in your life. Notice of me first in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 and verse 18. The New Testament speaks of the impact that this guarantee has in the life of a Christian. Romans chapter 4 and verse 18 says about Abraham in hope, this is this word, in this promised guaranteed future, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. Guys, it's just like me and you as a Christian. God has told you there is waiting for you an absolute guaranteed future in heaven. You will see God. You will live in His presence. You will have eternal life. This is happening. It's coming to you very soon. And right now, what do you have to hang on to? The fact that God told you it is. Same thing with Abraham. Abraham, God said, this is what's going to be. Abraham grabs on to that guarantee from God even though externally there's nothing he can see with his eyes that would give him a human hope about it. But God said it, and that guarantee is enough, the Bible says, Abraham, verse 19, did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body. And some of us as Christians sometimes, God's given you the guarantee. I've given you grace and peace. There is a guarantee waiting for you in heaven. And sometimes in the middle of living this Christian life, you say, wow, there's a lot of people that used to follow Jesus and don't follow him anymore. And I'm discouraged, and I wonder, and I'm struggling, and it, is Christ really in me? Why is this such a battle? And then all of a sudden, God says to you, I'm making you a guarantee. I have something waiting for you in heaven. You are going to inherit it. And when God tells you that, it is His Word alone that although you look at your outward circumstances and the weakness of your own heart, the thing that picks you up and makes you keep going is He made you that promise. He says here, He did not weaken in faith when He considered His own body, which was as good as dead, as He was about 100 years old. Or when He considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no one believed made Him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Abraham says, God, I don't know how you were going to do it. Boy, and we can say as Christians, I look at my own heart sometimes and the doubts I have and the defeats that I have. But God has begun this letter telling me that I am under his eternal smile. I'm under his eternal favor. This is the way it's always going to be. I am completely well before God. There's nothing I'm missing. And he tells me right off the bat, I have a guaranteed future waiting for me in heaven. I just want you to know that. Well, it is those facts of the gospel that make a Christian, in spite of his own weakness, he continues on. In fact, he begins to rejoice he begins to praise God. He is so confident that what God has said is going to happen, he begins to praise Him now. Amen. Guys, you start thinking now. Can you imagine very, very soon you are going to stand in God's presence? 
You are going to live forever. You're going to be completely delivered from a body of any pain, any sorrow, any temptation. You are going to be forever with the Lord in the presence of the great King of Kings. This is going to happen. It's very soon. <coughs> Believe Him. Now, how can that help you when you go out here to your job every day and you go buy the groceries at the grocery store and you got to go and pay your bills? Whatever you've got to do. And the thing that is making you joyful and you get a flat tire driving down the road. What is it? It's the guarantee that God's given you. God wants this to be deep inside your heart. You start praising God now for it. God, I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to be in heaven with you. I can't wait to see you face to face and see all the things you have planned. As your word says, my eyes have never seen, my ears have never heard, it's never entered into my heart the things you prepare for those who love you. And God, I believe you're giving that to me. I begin to praise you now. I look forward to it. Man, God wants that. Can you imagine your earthly father saying that I'm making a promise to you? This is going to happen. I want you to be excited about it. Look at chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 of Romans. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace, this favor, this love of God in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Even right now, we are rejoicing in the future guarantee that God's given us. We rejoice in it now. Guys, this is the normal Christian life. The normal Christian life is someone rejoicing. That's the normal Christian life. When you really understand the promises that God's given you and you believe them, then you go about rejoicing. You're rejoicing now because you know God's made a promise to you and God does not lie. Notice chapter 12, verse 12 of Romans. Romans 12, 12. It says here, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Rejoice in this hope. Chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. You know what's a problem for so many of us? We're so wrapped up in this earth. Our eyes are right here and what we're feeling and the temptations and our circumstances. We're all wrapped up in here. God's saying, don't you know what's about to happen? Have you listened to me? Do you believe me? May God fill you with all joy and peace while you believe that you may abound in hope. Guys, I wonder if the people that know us hear us rejoicing in our future hope. Do we even do that? Wow, I mean, this is the normal Christian life. Notice Galatians chapter 5, verse 5. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 5 says, For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. You say, man, it's not easy being a Christian. It's such a struggle. I live in this body and this flesh and this, everything all around me all the time. And God is saying, you, I'm, I'm giving you an absolute guarantee. You are going to be you are right now. It's already waiting for you. You're going to be in place of total righteousness. Amen. Completely conformed to my statement in your heart, in your desires, in your thoughts. You're going to be. Amen. Through the Spirit, the Bible says, we eagerly wait for this. So listen to the language the Bible describes. It describes a person who's rejoicing in this hope and describes a person who is eagerly waiting for it. Man, I can't wait. You guys ever see sometimes a kid, you know, mom and dad tell him, like my brother tells me, he never tells Addie, his youngest daughter, the actual day we're going to do something, because she reminds him every day. Daddy, 13 days away, 12 days away, 11 days away. So you don't tell her when they're going to go. That way she doesn't start asking them for every single day. Is it tomorrow? Is it tomorrow? Is it tomorrow? You guys learn that when you're parents. You don't tell kids, you know, we're going to do this because, okay, when is it? They can't wait. 
Bible describes a Christian like that. He is eagerly waiting. Is it tomorrow? God. He says, you wait. I'm telling you. They are rejoicing. They are eagerly waiting. By the way, a person who eagerly waits is someone who really believes it's coming. They know that God's not saying this is something that could happen. They know it's going to happen. That's why they're excited. They know this is going to happen. Notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation, the guarantee. What is the thing, the spiritual armor that protects a mind of a Christian as he has many conflicting thoughts and temptations he battles with? The thing that is guarding his mind is the guarantee of salvation because he so firmly believes in this, God's promise. He's rejoicing. He's eagerly waiting for it. When arrows come his way, the fiery darts and the wrestlings come for the demonic powers that we engage in. Don't forget this, guys. That's why it's not easy. But when you have on your head the helmet, which is the hope of your salvation, that will be a great help for you. You're rejoicing in this promise. You're eagerly waiting for it. This is what makes a Christian live their life soberly and not get all wrapped up in the passions of their flesh because they believe the promise God's given them that very soon they are going to be in his presence and that hope purifies them. Notice 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. The scripture says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. This is, you see a person who is comforted, they're eagerly waiting, they're rejoicing. This is someone who believes the hope God's promised. They are, their hearts are just established. I am going to keep right on this path of every good work and word. Because I am guaranteed from God this is coming. It's worth it. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Because you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The Lord Jesus rose and you're going to rise with him. God's promise. Look at Titus chapter 1 verse 2. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God who never lies promised before the ages began. God has absolutely guaranteed you you are going to live forever. So just get your story. And guess what? The life you have coming to you is a life in which you're never going to be tired. You're never going to be bored. You're never going to be depressed. You're never going to be discouraged. You're never going to be disappointed. Imagine being in existence where you're never tired, never discouraged, never depressed, never disappointed. It's awesome. That's what God is guaranteeing to you. Get excited about it. Rejoice in it. Eagerly wait for it. And make that make you firm right now in every good work and word. Notice Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There, by the way, notice that Jesus is called God. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous of good works. Guys, you know what? You see a Christian that's really struggling with sin. This is a guy that's taken his eyes off his hope. When a person is really fixed on God's future promise that they are going to be in heaven, they're going to see him soon. And it's going to be so worth it right now to say no to this and say yes to God. And do what God wants me to do in this moment. 
When a person's really focused on their hope, that's a person that's renouncing in godliness and worldly desires. You see a Christian that's being defeated by these things, this is a person who doesn't think about his hope at all. That's the real problem. <clears throat> Chapter 3, verse 7, Titus. Being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Guys, legally, if you're an heir, you are going to inherit it. And the Bible says you have become an heir according to the guarantee of eternal life. And by the way, the word zoe, we have a, a, a cute little baby in this church called zoe. This is the word life. And by the way, this Greek word life is life as it was meant to be. Life as it was in the beginning. Life in the Garden of Eden where everything was joy and peace and exploration and excitement and love. There was nothing bad in it. Everything was good. You wouldn't want to be off this earth, that life. You're, sometimes people in this life, they said, boy, I want it to be over. I heard people say. That's the kind of life you would never want it to be over. You could never imagine it. The Bible says that God has given you this, this hope. You are the inheritor of it's guaranteed you. It's already in the will. It's as good as yours. It's coming. Notice chapter Hebrews, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6. Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence in our boasting, in our hope. These are the people that really are God's Jesus' house. They're the people that boast in their hope. They rejoice in it. They eagerly wait for it. It establishes them. It comforts them. It defines their life. The thing that's defining their life is God's promise. That's what's defining their life. Those are the people that really are Jesus' house. The ones who boast in their hope. Notice chapter 6, verses 11 and 12 of Hebrews. <coughs> and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you not may, you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who faith, who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You keep trusting. You be patient. Don't get sluggish. One of my pastor friends, I, I think, made a very good point. I saw he comment yesterday. He said back at 9-11, when that first happened, and many of us remember this, I remember in 9-11, a couple things. Do you guys remember here in Rhode Island driving down Interstate 95 and the American flag was hanging off of every overpass driving down the highway? People were driving up and down. I never saw more American flags in my life. People driving up and down the road, everyone, their houses. It was amazing. I remember walking in the Super Walmart on Route 2 three days after 9-11, I'm walking through there. We were having a big youth outreach that weekend. And I'm gathering materials for it. I hear over the loudspeaker in Walmart, Billy Graham speaking to everybody inside the Walmart. And there was a time, guys, if you remember, about a month, a lot of people went back to church. People were turning to God. And my pastor friend in Delaware said he imagines, as he looks back, at that time, they had about 45 people become Christians within a month after 9-11. They were baptizing people left and right. He said, how now it is 20 years later. And he said, now as I look around the Christian church in America, even our own, and I see people falling away. So. The Bible says it's going to be this way before our hope arrives. That because iniquity abounds, the love of many is going to grow cold. In fact, the Bible says when Jesus returns, when the one that we all have been waiting for returns, will he find faith on the earth? We've got to look at our own hearts, guys. Right now, in my heart, is my mind rejoicing and eagerly waiting for the promise that God's given me that I will soon be with him. And all will be well. All is well now. I've already inherited it. You, keep, you fix your mind on that promise. 
And this is what will keep you from fading away and becoming sluggish. Or being defeated by sin. I'm telling you right now, you see a Christian that's being defeated, this is a person that's not thinking about God's promise. They're not believing. The flesh is more real to them than God is. I told you guys recently there was a famous Christian counselor who wrote a book, When People Are Big and God Is Small. What are you talking about? I think you could write a book, When Passions Are Big and God Is Small. When things are right in the Christian life, God is big. Everything else is small. Where is it for you right now? If you'll think about God's guarantee to you, it'll change the way you live. Notice a few more passages. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 16, saying the same chapter. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and all their disputes and oath is final for confirmation. You've heard people say that. You know, they make these guys, now when they come to the Senate, and they're going to give a testimony, they make them swear on the Bible. I'm telling you, I'm about to tell you the truth. I take an oath to say that before God who is greater than you. The Bible says people do this. So when God, verse 17, desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. God says, I am telling you, this is my purpose for you. You will be with me for all eternity. You will be righteous and have eternal life and peace, and joy forevermore. I promise you, and, I, and by the way, I'm not only telling you that's going to happen, I promise you it's going to happen. Now, I can't swear by anybody greater because I'm God, but I promise you it's going to happen. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, what are the two unchangeable things? His purpose and his promise. We who have fled for refuge, that's to Jesus, might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Like I said, guys, this is the sure and steadfast anchor of a Christian's life. It is God's guarantee of heaven, of him. That is the thing that anchors them in this world. And when the winds of temptation blow and discouragement, all kinds of things happen in life, the thing that's keeping them both sure and steadfast is his guaranteed future inheritance. I asked him when he began today, do you have an anchor? What is it? For the Christian, it's this hope. Notice chapter 10, verse 23 of Hebrews, chapter 10 and verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And guys, what does he say about our inheritance? It is imperishable. That means it's indestructible. No one can destroy this. No one will just destroy this inheritance. It is indestructible. It is undefiled. It will never be stained. And it will never fade. This inheritance will not fade, will not be stained, and will not be destroyed. It's guaranteed. Because this is true, verse 6, you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So the test of genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. It is filled with the future inheritance. It's already filled now. And what will you do? You will obtain the outcome of your faith. This is the thing that enables a Christian. I don't care what's going on in his life. It's the sure and steadfast anchor of his life. It's the thing that gives him unexplainable joy. It's future glory. It is his inheritance. It's God's promise to him about the hope laid up for him in heaven. You see a Christian that's fading away. 
falling away. They don't believe what God's promised them. Notice verse 21 of the same chapter. Who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Guys, who could you have more hope in? We can't have confidence in him. There's nobody. Chapter 3, verse 15 says to Christians in 1 Peter, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. The normal Christian life, when it's healthy and well, is believing what God has said. It is rejoicing. It is eagerly waiting for it. It is comforted. It is established in every good work and word. And because of that, people around someone like this want to talk to them because they're not like everybody else they know, even religious people who say these words, but when push comes to shove, they follow their flesh. They follow their feelings. They say these words. They say them, but not really. When you meet a person that this really is true, that this is the thing that they absolutely believe what God has promised them, it is a thing that regulates their behavior, causes them to renounce ungodliness, and to live with joy and eager expectation and patience, and comforts them and establishes them. People want to talk to someone. That's a question to ask ourselves. How many people in my life have ever wanted to, to know more about the rejoicing and hope that I have? Now, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. Look what it says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See what kind of love. The Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and we will, and what we will be has not yet appeared. What's going to happen when we go to heaven? We're not sure. But we know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is, and everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as he is pure. That's why I say, guys, when I look at my own heart, times when I've taken my eyes off the Lord, lines of my feelings or temptations, that's when we struggle. When your mind is fixed on this hope and the confidence of what God has promised you, that's what enables you to, to get pure. Notice back in our text now as we come towards the end, Colossians chapter 1 again. He says here in Colossians chapter 1, Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, verse 5, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing. Do you know the word increasing means causing growth? Guys, if you have really heard the gospel and you have really believed it, the Bible says it is bearing fruit in you and it is causing growth. If you can say, I believe these things, but they are not bearing fruit in you and they are not producing growth, the reality is you don't believe these things, no matter what you say. Because when you really understand the gospel and you receive it, it bears fruit and it causes fruit. I told you guys uh, several years ago, this was back in 2008, a very surprising circumstance in my physical health. I was at a gym one day and I was working out and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I felt like someone put their hands on the left side of my chest. I had no other symptoms. I just felt as though someone kind of gripped the left side of my chest. I was not nauseous. I was not weak. I was not sweating. Nothing. 
except that. I had never felt it before. It was strange. I felt like something was wrong. I left the gym. I drove right to Rhode Island Hospital. They took me in. They observed me overnight. Over the course of the evening, they said, Ted, you actually had a small heart attack. Over the course of a couple of weeks, they ended up giving me a stint. The very bottom left tip of my heart. They said, thankfully, this happened to you, number one, at a very early age, and number two, at a very tiny, the very bottom tip of your heart, so you had no muscle damage, which was a huge blessing. They said, nevertheless, we think you ought to have a sit there. Well, I'll tell you what, guys, for the next couple of weeks, I would feel these strange feelings, you know, like, like maybe something happened to me again. Because when you had something like that happen to you, you don't know how to read, what, what am I feeling right now? And they actually told me, sometimes when you've had a heart incident, your body almost mimics it for a while. You almost feel like something's happening, and it isn't. But for a couple weeks, there were a couple times I'd go back to the hospital. Like, well, I don't know what's happening. I, I remember one weekend, I checked in over for a week again. They checked me out. They said, there's nothing going on. I remember another time, about a week later, I got an ambulance, went to Miriam Hospital. You know, what's going on? I feel these strange feelings. You know what changed everything for me the last time I went? This happened to me a few times. I think I went to the hospital two other times after I left. The last time I was there, this is 2008, the head cardiologist at Miriam came in. He said, Ted, listen. I have read everything. I've analyzed every test. You are well. Your heart is fine. You're going to be fine. That's all I needed to hear. When he gave me the guarantee that it was fine, I was out of there. And later on, for a while, I might feel some strange things, but I knew that it was fine. Why? Because I had that guarantee. That's what I needed to hear. For the Christian, God has given you an absolute guarantee. This is coming very soon. You're going to have my total righteousness. You're going to have life as it was meant to be, life in the beginning, real life, real zoe. Yes. You're going to be in my presence. There will be no sorrow, no pain, no death. None of these things will all be gone. I'm going to wipe away every tear from your eyes. I absolutely promise you this is going to happen. This is your future. Now, ladies and gentlemen, believe him. Notice how this ends. Just as you learn, verse 7, this gospel from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love and the Spirit. You know what's really awesome, guys? There are many people, there are people from a certain city that live 2,000 years, a lot of people in that city, they're all in heaven today because of the faithful ministry of one man who is not an apostle. He just names Epaphras. He was just a person who believed the gospel and cared enough to go to the city that he lived in and tell his neighbors. People who also believed the gospel there and their lives were changed. They had a whole letter written to them. And who was the man that God used to bring him to Jesus? Was it Paul? Was it Peter? Was it James? Was it John? No. But there's a man named Epaphras. Just a faithful believer in the gospel. Ladies and gentlemen, the hope laid up for you in heaven is the sure and steadfast anchor of the Christian soul. Is this gospel of hope bearing fruit and causing growth in you. Let's pray. Lord, help us this morning to believe the hope that you've given to us, Lord, that you have told us in the word of truth, the gospel. We pray, Lord, that this will bear fruit and cause growth in us. We pray in Jesus' name.